Uh, now, we've done plenty of talking today, but we want to give you guys a chance uh, to talk as well. I know you have a lot of questions about things that were said and maybe things that weren't said uh, that you would like to know about. So please, um, let's, let's have some, uh, some questions from the audience. Yes, sir. As most statists believe, they, they use the 2008 crisis as a, an excuse for an increased state power. But I, have, I would like to entertain one of the defenses. What is appropriate regulation and what is inappropriate regulation? And for say, could not be too big after or before a crisis. Yeah. So, so I'm going to repeat, uh, summarize the questions for our audience uh, listening on the internet. The question is about, uh, 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 instead of talking about regulation in general, are there specific regulations that would be appropriate in particular to prevent uh, you know, financial contagion or something like that? Or maybe to another question, to put the question in a different way, this is not what you asked, but I'll, but I'll add to your question anyway. If, if you put Bob Murphy and Peter Klein in charge, and we were able to get rid of the most harmful regulations today, but it would take us a while to get to some of the others, what would we, what would we strike down first? I'll let you comment first. Okay. Um, if I just speak, can you guys hear me? Is this amplifying? Yeah. Okay. Um, so, well, one thing, let me just make this point, and then I'll, I'll let him chime in. Uh, the problem when you, when you do things like this is that the government right now is subsidizing thir certain things. And so, as, as some people put it, uh, you've got this issue of what's called moral hazard with the commercial banks, for example, where there's this thing called FDIC, Federal Deposit Insurance. And so right now, uh, consumers don't have the incentive, when you go and open a checking account with the bank, you don't go and, and do a bunch of research to make sure, well, what do these guys do with their money? Let me make sure you know, this is a solid bank because you know if something were to happen, this bank were to fail, I would get reimbursed by FDIC. And so the, the, there, there, is, there are a lot of free market economists who say maybe it is appropriate for the government to lay down certain regulations about what investment firms can do with their money, given that we have this sort of blanket subsidy and this, this, this escape hatch, as it were. So that, in other words, the, the best of all worlds would be don't subsidize them, but, and then don't regulate them, just let the market regulate people. But it's not obvious, well, given that we do have all these subsidies, should we then let them do whatever they want? It, just to give a different example, Murray Rothbard mentioned this one uh, when it came to like, this, the former Soviet republics desocializing and, and when we have what's called deregulation in the United States and elsewhere. And he said, look, from one point of view, you know, I'm against price controls. I'm against the government telling businesses what they can charge for their product. But if we're going to give the post office a monopoly on the delivery of first class mail, I'm not sure I want to give them the freedom to charge whatever the market will bear. It might be appropriate to say to the post office, no, you can only charge such and such for a stamp. And if you want to raise prices, you've got to get permission from us because we're giving you that monopoly. And so Rothbard said it would be wrong to say, oh, it's a move towards freer markets if we just lifted the ability of the post office to, to charge uh, or to, to get price fixing from the government. So that's a kind of framework, and I'll, I'll let you be more specific. That, that, and that's, I, was gonna, I would give the same response. Uh, another example is you think of the police department, right? So Mises wrote about the appropriate way to manage a police department. Let's assume that you have a government-provided, government-funded police department. Uh, you know, a free market economist wouldn't say, well, you shouldn't impose any restrictions on what policemen can do out on the street. You know, you, they should get, there should be a, a performance bonus based on number of arrests, and you give them complete latitude to decide how they want to uh, get their arrest rate up, right? And, and, then, and, and, and if I said, gee, I don't think that sounds like a good idea. I think we ought to have some restrictions on what police officers can do. You wouldn't say, well, I thought you were in favor of the free market, right? So you're in favor of regulation then? Well, I mean, that's not regulation, right? Now, where it becomes more complicated is if you look at, you know, take Goldman Sachs. Okay, Goldman Sachs is not nominally a branch of the federal government, like the, like, uh, the, the post office or, or a branch of a local government like a police department. But a lot of times, de facto, I think Goldman Sachs might as well be part of the federal government. I mean, it's so closely tied to, so heavily protected by, so, so strongly subsidized by, you know, I don't lose a lot of sleep over, uh, you know, uh, regulations from the financial, uh, financial regulators restricting what Goldman Sachs can do. I mean, 
th that feels like one set of um, distortions trying to counteract another set of distortions. As Bob said, the, the best outcome would be to remove the distortions on all sides, right? But it is, you know, it, it's, it's just something that has to be de determined on a very careful sort of case-by-case -case basis. Um, if we can't repeal all of the regulations, it's possible that changing one may actually lead to a net increase in government intervention, right? Again, if you're subsidizing a firm's losses, but then allowing it to do whatever activities it wants where the taxpayers are on the bill, foot the bill for the loss, it's not obvious that that's a move in favor of a freer market. Okay? So it's a great question, though. What else? Yes, sir. Well, my question was, in dealing with economics, you mentioned that the main, basically the goal of an economist or a businessman or anybody in the business sector is to basically predict what people are going to want or maybe what a whole society is going to want in a sense. So basically what my question is, with all the different venues that companies, businesses have at their hands, different forms of statistics, whatnot, what do you think is the most reliable way of predicting what people want? Um, and maybe tying it into the example that was just mentioned as far as the computer with the housing industry, I guess how to avoid such a situation where one becomes so immersed in a statistic and number that it kind of absence from the human element that you can see how it yeah. The okay, thank you. So, so there, there's, there's there are two parts to your question as I read it, a kind of a theoretical part or theoretical issue and a practical one. The theoretical one is to just to ask us to restate, is it the right way to think about what an entrepreneur does as trying to predict or forecast what consumers will want to buy? And second, if so, what, what's the right way to do that? And is it possible that even private entrepreneurs nowadays are over-reliant on quantitative statistical models to try to predict the future as opposed to using intuition or, or gut instinct or something like that. I, it's, it's a really excellent question. Uh, uh, let me take a, I'll, I'll take the first stab uh, this time. Um, I think the way you characterized the situation is, is, is just right, although I, I might, the word predict is a little bit tricky in that case because we use the word prediction in the philosophy of science you know, to me, you think about, you know, predicting in the laboratory, the scientific sense of one molecule interacting with another. I mean, I, I would tend to use language that's more about, um, uh, you know, sort of intuition or understanding or a word that Mises used, judgment, right? So I, maybe instead of saying that entrepreneurs try to predict the future or try to predict what consumers will want, we say, could say that entrepreneurs exercise judgment or discretion about you know, what they imagine the future state of the market to be. Right? And that includes not only trying to anticipate how much consumers will be willing to pay for something, but also what competitors will do, right? what other products will be available on the market at that time, what the overall you know, what, what macroeconomic conditions will be at that time. Maybe consumers will really like this new phone I'm producing, but if it comes out in the middle of a recession and people don't, you know, they're not spending as much on electronics, that's something I have to take into account as well. It's very complicated, right? And you're absolutely right that it isn't something that quantitative models can ultimately, or with any sort of sense of finality, you know, predict the way that we think of science predicting. Um, Mises uh, has a discussion of differences between the kind of scientific quantitative prediction that we usually have in mind and the more intuitive sort of notion of business judgment. Um, he, he, Mises uses uh, the same kind of distinction uh, with slightly different language that is often associated with another famous American economist named Frank Knight. Frank Knight is not a member of the Austrian school, but Frank Knight is famous for distinguishing between what he called uncertainty and risk. So risk is where we don't know what is going to happen tomorrow or we don't know what's going to happen in the future, but we know a lot about the problem and we can characterize it in a very formal way, like throwing dice. Okay, if I have a six-sided die and I roll the die, I don't know what number is going to come up, but I know there, if it's a normal die, you know, I know there are six possible numbers and the probability that any one number will come up is one-sixth. Okay, but saying, you know, what is the likelihood that I will be able to make money selling my new phone, that's a far greater level of complexity. And Knight argued that what we, you know, we wouldn't characterize that as a risky situation because we don't know the probability distribution. Rather, that's a situation of kind of deep fundamental uncertainty. 
Now, the entrepreneur can try to use quantitative tools. He can hire a marketing firm. He can do surveys. He can do interviews. He can look at past buying trends and try to anticipate. So statistical forecasting tools would be part of the entrepreneurs. They would be in the entrepreneur's toolkit. But successful entrepreneurs do not rely exclusively on those kinds of approaches because the future in a, you know, in a, in a complex market economy full of human beings, right, is not, it can't be characterized like throwing dice. It's characterized by, you know, real fundamental uncertainty rather than risk. And it may be that a lot of financial market professionals were also seduced by the siren song of these quant quantitative models, you know, constructed by the smartest, the physicists with the highest IQs and so forth. But, you know, that may not be relevant for dealing with human beings, de dealing with, you know, human problems. Yeah, just to elaborate on that a little bit, it's, uh, and people ask us that a lot, too, you know, question being, you know, you, you Austrians, you know that you, you can't model human beings the way that physicists model uh, particles and so forth, and so doesn't that, you know, doesn't that mean you're against any, any company that relies, you know, in terms of its marketing or whatever on these statistical approaches? And, uh, and no, I don't think that that follows. Like Peter said, I mean, you can, they can do whatever they want, and the ultimate proof would be, if it's profitable because they're using those those methods of modeling their customers, well, great. But if it turns on a dime, which it all, which we know it could, and it blows up in their face, well, then in retrospect, we can say that that wasn't a good idea. The other thing too is, if it really were the case that all you needed were uh, to use the right statistical approach, and then boom, it would be obvious what the investment decisions would be. Well, then you wouldn't be able to earn a profit from it because everybody would be doing that, right? So the way you earn what we mean by profit you know, an above average return on something is, is because you saw a possibility or an opportunity that other people didn't see. Yeah. The other point is that uh, the, the, the metaphor of, you know, the, the, that consumers and consumer preferences are steering the ship and that the entrepreneur is sort of uh, constrained by, subject to the whim of the consumer in deciding what is, you know, what will work or, or, or not. I mean, that is a metaphor. Right. Remember, remember what Steve Jobs famously said. You know, Steve Jobs said, "Well, you know, consumers don't know what they want until I show it to them." In other words, that you know, the entrepreneur is not just sort of a helpless slave of consumer, you know, sort of random consumer passion. No, of course, entrepreneurs work with buyers. They work with consumers to try to shape, you know, some kind of a shared vision of what the future and what the future could look like. So, entrepreneurs are, of course, active participants in trying to bring about a future state of affairs that they want, not merely passive recipients of, you know, things that just sort of randomly come down the pike. Okay. Great, great questions. Um, let me, yes, uh, uh, lady behind first and then in front. Thank you. I'd like to bring up two subjects, and only two, and get your reaction to. Number one, I'm aware of the 50 to 100 year infiltration by Marxism of all our institutions, particularly education, the universities, the press, Hollywood, foundation, to the point where I have zero trust in many of these institutions. Zero. They're all corrupt and they're being, their lives are being perpetuated all the time. And I don't know to what extent these young people have any knowledge of it. I've lived long enough to be aware of it. Now let me, so that's one thing. It's very real. And, you know, when I was growing up, communism was the bugaboo. But they went underground and they have succeeded. And I see our main task is trying to bring this country back or we will fail. So, okay, so that's one thing. The other thing is, take the financial crisis. I happen to have a Wall Street background. I remember the hearings on this. I watched them on C-SPAN. There was a minority, the Democrats controlled wherever the hearings were. The, the majority report blamed all the Wall Street companies. It, but there was a minority report that brought out the government role in forcing banks to lend money to people who could not pay. It was like reparation. Hey, we're going to give you the money you never had. You do it or we won't regulate you properly. So, so this leads to the regulatory state, and in my lifetime, there is so much more regulation than ever, that ever existed. I don't even want to work because I'm probably doing something that's going to get me in trouble. These regulations are written by bureaucrats like Kafka, 
Yes. You don't know what they're going to come out with, and there's no control. No one controls it. No one checks it. The health care bill, pages of, and the financial bill, pages and pages of regulations written by nameless bureaucrats affecting every one of us. We don't have, we don't know what they are, we have no control of it. And this leads to the crony capitalism. I don't know when you think that started, but it makes it, me, the average citizen, feel stupid. Oh, you mean I didn't go to Washington to get my share of the government handout? What's wrong here? I should have grown up thinking I got to go into Washington to get my hands on power so I can get the taxpayer money for myself. That's not how I was taught when I grew right. up, but that's how it is now. So could you comment on the Marxist infiltration? And number two, yes. the, the lies told by the press and the crony capitalism that's emerged where business does not try to get its share, someone else will get the money. Yes. Yeah. Th th thank you for your comments. Um, well, let me let me propose this. I I'm I'm sure that we both agree <laughs> with with your comments. Let's take one or two more questions, and then we can maybe respond to them to get uh, all at the same time. Yes, ma'am. Oh, I wanted to know uh, what if any resources you might be aware of for teaching our children about entrepreneurship. Oh, great. Yeah. Great question. A actually, the question is about uh, resources for teaching entrepreneurship to young people. Um, why don't I, let me address that, Bob, first, and also the, the previous uh, set of comments, uh, simply by saying that uh, it's true that existing institutions, including our institutions of higher learning, established universities, colleges, and secondary schools, and so forth, um, you know, trying to, to transform them into the kinds of institutions that we would desire, getting them to teach what we think should be taught. Uh, that's, a, that's a pretty tough row to hoe. And so an alternative to trying to transform existing institutions is to bypass them, is to do an end run around them by creating our own kind of alternative institutions. In a sense, that's what the Mises Institute does the, the, uh, from our Mises Academy program that I mentioned before, which offers things that are like college courses right, to events like this, to, you know, all of our uh, materials on our website, right, you can think of that as an attempt to build up an alternative educational paradigm uh, where students, uh, you know, they're not enslaved to the ideas that come to them from the established institutions, which are very, very hard to change. So rather than infiltrate the government, the media, the established media and universities, it might be more profitable to set up our own alternative media, educational institutions, and so on. Which leads me to your question about um, business education. I mean, uh, there are you know, a number of good resources. Of course, you can, you can start by looking on Mises.org. Dr. Murphy has authored one of the politically incorrect guides, uh, politically incorrect guide to capitalism, right? And also a set of lectures for high school and beginning college students, lectures to the young economist. Um, why don't I let Bob talk about those, and if he doesn't, uh, then I might be able to add something about uh, things specifically for business and entrepreneurship. Uh, well, sh sure. So it's, uh, yeah, the, the book is Lessons for the Young Economist, um, you know, and all the stuff that, at the Mises Institute is, you can get the, the PDF if you want to look at it and see what it is. Um, and, and that just goes through giving a lot of free market lectures, because a lot of the problem I think that Peter and I have is when we get students at the college level or, or older, and they've learned a bunch of you know, Keynesian economics, and then we're basically trying to undo that. And so here we were thinking, well, like, what if you just caught someone who hadn't heard that, so just teach them what we think of as proper free market economics from the get-go. Uh, and then, as he said, the, the politically incorrect guide to capitalism isn't a textbook, that's more of a, uh, you know, as a popular p uh, book, just taking a bunch of topics like environmentalism and uh, minimum wage laws, rent control, and just trying to give a you know, two, three page analysis of, of why the conventional wisdom on that is, is wrong and that government intervention actually gives the, the opposite outcome. So tying into uh, what the um, earlier questions were there, I mean, it's, it's true. Uh, I do a lot of work uh, in policy circles about what climate change issues and things like that. And, and you do a lot of times, you know, I say to my colleagues, you know, these people who want the government to do such and such because of climate change, you get the sense that they're, you know, they're giving reasons they know will resonate with the public, but really they don't like the, you know, 
know, the American way of life. They don't like Americans consuming so much. Like, that just offends them. They don't like that aesthetically. And so that, you know, and, and you get that sense. Just to give you one quick example, because they're talking about, um, you know, if, you, if you're really concerned about carbon emissions, you should be a big booster of nuclear power. But most of the groups who are totally for a big carbon tax and we got to have, you know, electric cars, they're not for power plants, or they're not for nuclear power plants, even though those have zero carbon emissions. Right, so little things like that where it looks like, well, wait a minute, if they really thought about the thing they're, they're saying they care about, it would be such and such. So, but what do you do? I think, unfortunately, we're in the minority and the public you know, thinks that we're apologists for big business or whatever. And so I think it's better if we just teach proper economics and hope that that gets absorbed as opposed to justifiably, in, in many cases, correctly pointing out you know, the, the motivations of, the, of our opponents because that... You know, I think a lot of people are just going to be turned off by that. One other thing on uh, on books, uh, that we also have a textbook authored by David Gordon that's available at Mises.org called, uh, I think it's called Introduction to Economic Reasoning, that is designed for high school students. Some of you might be interested in that. Uh, but there are a lot of other individuals and organizations that have produced good curricula. Um, uh, one of my kids has really enjoyed a series of comic books on entrepreneurship and management authored by some business school professors. One is an associate of mine named David Ketchen, K-E-T-C-H-E-N. Uh, sorry, I think the correct term now is graphic novels. So they're graphic novels on entrepreneurship and management uh, aimed at, at a high school or college audience. And there are a number of good resources out there uh, that, would, that, that, that can help in this way. So thank you. Other questions and comments? Yes, sir. I really like something that you touched on a little bit more about the type of regulation that we want to give to government agencies. If you look at our Bill of Rights, it's essentially a list of regulations sure. on the government itself. But in thinking about regulation, we've heard about some that can be stifling. The question, when I started learning about this, that came up was, well, what about regulations that would appear to be helpful? Regulations mm -hmm. for employee safety, for mm -hmm. patient safety. I'm a doctor, and one of the things I think about is, well, if everybody's getting antibiotics over the counter whenever they want, well, soon we're going to start to have a bunch of uh, infections that are resistant right. to antibiotics. And that's not something that a market will necessarily take into place. So how do we... Sure. That or is there a sure. So, good. so the question is about, uh, well, you know, talking about some of these financial industry regulations, okay, sure, people understand that those might be helping big banks or something. But what about more difficult cases like health and safety regulation? government regulations on what kind of things can be in, in food or use of medicine that ostensibly, according to their proponents, are designed to protect the public from harmful practices of businesses and other people. How would we go about addressing what are some good arguments that we would use to challenge those kind of assumptions? I'm going to ask Bob to sure. start with. I don't know enough about medicine to talk about that, but let me, I have written about the FAA, all right, and so the, the federal government's regulation of airlines, because that's something where you know, the general public advice, you know, I don't think the federal government should be regulating air travel at all. Let the market settle it. That sounds crazy. And you know, people go, oh, there'd be planes dropping out of the sky. You say, well, wait a minute. You know, the, the planes cost a lot of money for those airlines. Do you really think they're not going to take care of them? The, the, they say, okay, no, they wouldn't be dropping out of the sky, but clearly we want the government to, it, it can't hurt to have the government come in and lay regulations on top of it to, you know, do random spot checks to see if the pilots are drunk to just send in random people to check the equipment and make sure it's up to date and that sort of thing. But I, I can argue that no, actually, I think it, it is harmful because it would displace what the market would do instead. And just the, 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 the crucial thing here is to remember, just because the government has an official program and hires a bunch of people and gives them a job to do, doesn't mean they're actually gonna achieve it. So just because they have this agency devoted to airline safety, by itself doesn't prove air travel safer, safer uh, one example of what I mean is when there is a crash, you know, so when, I, when I was growing up, there was a big thing in, in the Everglades, and it was, um, was, it, was it called Value Jet? Was that mm -hmm. the name? What's it now? Is it AirTran? Yeah, Air Tran. so they changed their name. But, um, and that was a huge, and it was a big deal because they violated all of these regulations, right? And there were all these FAA things that they didn't do, and the FAA signed off on, and they shouldn't have. Did the FAA get its budget cut in half? No, they got more money, and there's like, this proves, look at how bad the market is. The FAA needs more money because they're understaffed. So clearly we got to give them. More. So it's this perverse thing where when a government regulatory body screws up, everyone just blames the free market. And so like there's, there's no way it could ever be the case. A, a different example is the government, the, the Bureau of Land, and uh, I forget their, they changed their name to, the BLM is what they used to be called. More recently, the people who are supposed to be regulating big oil. 
and they got in trouble. They were literally letting oil representatives throw parties where they were bringing in like cocaine and other things that are illegal and immoral and having a big party and they had a cake that said drill baby drill on it and stuff. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so these are the guys regulating the oil industry and so the idea that we need big government to, to put a check on big bit. I mean, that's, that's very naive that in reality what happens is, you know, the, the big regulated corporations co-opt the people regulating them. That's a nice cozy relationship. And so the one person, the people that don't benefit are the average consumers in the mom and pop shops. So I guess the, the quick answer would be the market can regulate too. So it's not that we're against third party oversight. It's we're saying when the government comes in and does it, it performs as well as the government does anything else that it tries. Yeah, I mean, this leads to an important general point. When we talk about the free market and what a society would be like if we had a free market without an interventionist state, well, we're not claiming that such a society would be a utopia, right? That it would be peace and love and kumbaya and everyone would be nice to their neighbors. No, I mean, it would. this society would still be populated by fallible human beings that uh, you know are subject to whims and passion and there would be bad people who want to do bad things and so forth the question is you know what set of social arrangements uh, is most likely to minimize will minimize the harm that's caused by all of the foibles that make us human beings including ignorance and malice and apathy and so forth so would you want the institutions that try to encourage safety right i mean government safety regulators do not eliminate harm Right? There are still plane crashes. There are unsafe, people get sick from food they eat. Medicine can do harm to people who take government approved medicine. So there's certainly no utopia. The government doesn't create a utopia. The question is what kinds of institutions, what kinds of individuals, what kinds of arrangements are going to mitigate, best mitigate that kind of potential harm? Would it be independent third party inspectors and certifiers who make a living from their reputation? for doing high quality work and for integrity and so forth. If you had a private market driven, you know, uh, 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 supervising authority that was throwing the kind of parties that Bob just described with the people supposedly inspected, what would happen to a, a private inspection company like that? They would go out of business tomorrow, right? Because they, they could only make money by having a reputation for integrity and honesty and uh, you know, and high quality, and so on. But government regulators have no incentives to be, uh, you know, to, to, to do what they ostensibly are charged to do. There's no connection between their performance and their reputation in the eyes of the public, and the resources they have to control their salaries, and, and so on. Right. So we're not claiming that we can wave a magic wand and make all bad things go away. We're saying that taking very difficult situations and putting the government in charge of making them right merely exacerbates the problem rather than making the problem better. We think we can minimize harm in other ways by relying on voluntary peaceful interaction among people rather than government coercion. I think we have time for maybe just one more question. Is there anyone who, yeah. Um, okay, yes sir, in the back. Von Mises, uh, at one, uh, this is a standard Austrian tenet that government can distort prices and that a market, a free market in order to work would have to have honest prices or prices being true. Mm -hmm. However, a critique of this is that what if in a free market businesses and corporations also distort prices and sales? Okay, so the question is about uh, price distortions. Uh, when government distorts prices through price controls and subsidies and so forth, that has harmful consequences to resource allocation. The question is, what about private entities distorting prices? So you mean uh, firms conspiring uh, to, to raise prices or something like that? Yeah, I mean, it's a good question. The short answer, since we're about out of time, is that the way Austrian economists typically think about prices is a little bit different from the way a lot of mainstream economics textbooks think about prices. So in, in the typical treatment that you get in the average textbook, there's a certain kind of price which they might label as the competitive price or the perfectly competitive price which is good and desirable and has all these properties that we've been talking about, it's giving signals to entrepreneurs and so forth. 
but some prices can be off away from these equilibrium prices because of monopolizing attempt, uh, 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 you know, uh, firms that have so-called market power and they can charge prices that are higher than these competitive prices. Well, Austrian economists deny the legitimacy of that distinction between competitive prices and monopoly prices as long as there is no government intervention in the market. So whatever prices obtain through the voluntary interactions of individuals and firms are competitive in the sense that people are free to pay them or not to pay them and your business partner is free to agree with you to charge the high price that you want or to disagree with you and try to undercut your price and so forth. Right, the only distinction that we would typically recognize is between prices that come about on the free market and prices like you know the price of a first class letter that's a price that is set by the government, right? So a government enterprise that charges a price for its services, that's not a market price, right? Or if the government passes a law that says uh, if you are hired to work for a firm, the firm cannot pay you less than X dollars per hour, right? That's not a free market price, that's a, that's a government price floor, right? So when government intervenes in prices, prices are different from what they would be on the market. But aside from that, any kind of, you know, whatever prices emerge from voluntary interactions among individuals and firms, we would not call those distortionary, even if they're higher or lower than we might like or prefer or, or instinctively, you know, be guided to. Okay. That's an excellent question. All the questions have been, have been terrific. Um, we are out of time. So I want to thank all of you for coming and thank our audience remotely for watching. I'd like to uh, thank Dr. Murphy for his talks. I guess I can thank myself for my talk also. <laughs> but we look forward to seeing all of you at a future Institute event. Uh, please look at our website, Mises.org, for, for resources, information on other events, including the online courses that I mentioned. And we look forward to seeing you all in person or uh, on the net. Bye-bye.